So I'd like to begin by saying this is the day of good news, a day of good news. But I want to refer back to that passage to 1 Corinthians that we read together earlier where Paul identifies five characteristics of the people that he chooses to represent him in the world. He chooses the foolish, the weak, the lowly, the despised, the things that are not literally the nothings to overturn the world's system of values. In the church today, there, is, there should be no concept of Christian stardom or Christian celebrity or personality cults. There are no heroes in the kingdom of God except Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords. When I was a missionary, I had the privilege to speak in a great missions church out west. And as the pastor introduced me that Wednesday evening, I got up, came to the pulpit, and the entire congregation stood to their feet and gave me a standing ovation. And while it seemingly felt good for a moment, I began to be more uncomfortable as it lasted, and I thought, I, I know who I am, but they don't know who I am. I know my weaknesses. I know all the daring exploits I've never done for Jesus. And so I felt compelled to tell them about my morning that I had had that day at the Springfield Airport on the way to see them. I arrived at the airport that morning, and as I pulled my roller bag into the terminal, I noticed people smiling, uh, chattering a bit, looking at me a bit longer than maybe they should have. But being friendly, generally nice, I came to the desk to check in. Again, the, the desk agent seemed very friendly and, and kind, but maybe a little sympathetic. And I thought, wow, that's a weird morning. I go through security, spend my time at the gate, go to the gate agent. Everywhere I go, people are really smiling at me and then turning to talk to one another <laughs> as my presence walks by. Only to realize when I found my seat on the plane and sat down, I had been unzipped the entire morning. <laughs> Guys, you know what I mean. So I said to the church gathered that night, I said, I want to thank you for the warm welcome, but you just gave a standing ovation to a guy who was unzipped most of the morning. <laughs> there are no heroes in God's kingdom. Today is a day of good news, but first, we need to work through a very dark period in Israel's history, a dark scripture, a a sobering scripture that describes a very desperate situation in the city of Samaria. Please listen and follow along as I read from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 24 through 31. This will set the stage for the message. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, help me, my lord the king. The king replied, if Yahweh does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor? From the wine press, then he asked her, what's the matter? She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today, and tomorrow we will eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him, but she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. As he went along the wall, the people looked, and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. He said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, 
remains on his shoulders today. It was a siege. The Aramean army had marched up against the city, and a siege warfare is where they surround the city, they cut off every avenue of escape, they cut off every way of receiving help into the city, and then they just camp around the city and wait for the people either to destroy themselves or to surrender. Conditions had deteriorated to such a degree that people began to lose their humanity. They became dehumanized with their desires just to survive so that a donkey's head, which was unclean meat in the first place, bony in the second place, would sell for 80 shekels of silver. And mothers were arguing over whose child to eat next. The economy was shattered. There was only demand. There was not supply to be found anywhere. We also find from the text that Elisha was locked up in the city with them. He was suffering with the people. And we should not be surprised. Matter of fact, we should be so aware that wherever there is disaster, wherever there is war, wherever there are things are terrible, in the world today, God's people are locked up and suffering with the people, with their neighbors. But Elisha did not lose his humanity because he was connected so strongly to divinity. And may Christians everywhere feel our prayers so that in desperate situations, they maintain their humanness as they represent the Lord Jesus Christ around the world. The prophet Elisha was doing what he does every day. He was sitting in his house. The elders gathered around him. The king is breathing threats. And he walks down to the house with an officer who's propping him up to confront Elisha with this disaster. And he comes to Elisha's house and he says, Elisha, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for him any longer? And Elisha's response is found in chapter 7, verse 1. He says, hear the word of the Lord. This is what Yahweh says. About this time tomorrow, a seah of the finest flour will sell for a shekel. And two seahs of barley will sell for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Consider Elisha's prophecy. In one 24-hour period or less, the entire economy, which is upside down, will be turned right side up. Demand will be diminished until supply is so plentiful that the markets will return to normal. And the marketplace, which normally opens and runs at the gate to the city, will be open, which implies that the entire army will be gone. Anybody here remember COVID? <laughs> yeah, that's me. I took this picture on March 20th, 2020. Sam's, uh, everything else was closing down, but Sam's was opening up at 7 in the morning for the elderly citizens. <laughs> and I got there early thinking I was going to get a good place in line. I got there maybe quarter seven. I found this line. We didn't know what we were dealing with, so I grabbed a mask from my garage, and I have on my mowing safety goggles. <laughs> I remember what you people look like, too. <laughs> and I stood in line, and something began to happen in our lives, in our hearts, as we began to think, what if I can't get enough toilet paper? Forget the food. I'm not going through a pandemic without toilet paper. And you would see carts piled with toilet paper. And you're thinking, man, did you leave any for the rest of us? You know, COVID's given us something to complain about for years now. <laughs> the distribution's network, lack of supply. Whenever we're not served very well, yeah, COVID, yeah, <laughs> COVID. What we experienced in COVID was minor irritation compared to what so many places in the world go through today. The literal desperation, the famine. And back in Samaria, 
it's the same thing. Meanwhile, back at the gate of Samaria, we find four lepers. I love these guys. They're standing around the city gate because they're not good enough to get into the awful city. And they're between the city and the opposing army, so at the first attack, they're the first to get squashed. And if we listen in, their conversation goes a little something like this. <laughs> what should we do? I don't know. What do you think we should do? It's like me and Emily trying to decide where to eat. <laughs> One of them says, look, if we say we'll, we'll go into the city, the famine is there, we will die. If we stay here, we will die. But if we go to the enemy's camp and surrender and they spare us, we live. They still had a will to live, but they were ready to die. They were emaciated, flesh on bone. They were riddled and rotting with their disease. They hardly had the appearance of human. And if any four individuals represented the nothings of this world, it is these four men. The nothings of the world are who Jesus chooses. At dusk, picture it. Lights fading. At dusk, they go down to the enemy's camp. And as they approach the camp, the most amazing thing comes upon them. There's not a soul in the camp, not a human person at all. They found donkeys and horses at their tethers, probably some animals in makeshift pens around, cooking fires, still smoldering, still burning, and they can't believe it. They've struck it rich. There's a little segue in the text that says, God had made a noise. He had caused the Arabian army to hear the sounds of horses, chariots, and a massive approaching army. And in the fading light, the Aramean army took off and left everything behind. And so when they had convinced themselves that everyone was gone, they go into the first tent. And they found food and they stuffed their shrunken stomachs until they couldn't eat anymore. And then they started rifling through the stuff, and they found silver and gold and clothes, and they piled it in their robes, and they ran out into the darkness and hid it. And then they came back, and they went to the second tent, and they found silver and gold, and they piled it in their robes, and they went out into the darkness and hid it, saving it for later where they could retrieve it later. But then they had a moment. Something happened. And I like to picture it this way. When they came to the door, the entrance of the third tent, instead of looking inside the tent, they looked up. And for as far as the eye could see in the twilight was row after row after row of tents, each of them filled with treasures and riches, things taken from other peoples as the army came through. And in that moment, a transformation happened. Let's read chapter 7, verse 9 together. Then they said to each other, read it with me, what we are doing is not right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once to the royal palace. In this moment, almost simultaneously, four th steps, four things happened that simply flipped their, their lives on its head. The first one is they realized that what they were doing was not right. They were hoarding and hiding the, the riches of the deliverance of God. They were keeping the good news for themselves. 
Then they experienced an awakening at the same time. This is a day of good news. There is more than enough for everyone. More than enough for us to use in lifetimes. More than enough for everyone else. God's deliverance has been epic. And everyone is still locked inside the city, suffering, waiting, ready to die. Then they remembered the consequences of doing nothing. If we wait until morning, judgment will overtake us. They realized there was a limited window of time to do the right thing. The right thing was to spread the good news. Doing nothing is the something we should never allow ourselves to do. I need to remind us that Jesus had a similar message in Matthew 25 with the parable of the servants and the talents. He tells the story of a king who was going away, but before he left, he shared a, a certain amount of talents with, with each of his servants. And when he came back from his journey, he met with each one and evaluated what had been done. But it was the unfaithful servant who did nothing that the king had harsh words for. He took away what had, he had been given, and the king said, take this unfaithful servant and cast him into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is important for us to feel and know that there is a limited window to do right things in our lives. The final step in the process is simply repentance. And it's, it's not a big deal when the other three things have happened. It, it's easy. It's just simply, let's go do the right thing. Now that I know, now that we know, let's do it together. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. So I'd like to invite the worship team to come back up. They're actually going to sing the last point of my sermon. And Josh wanted me to make sure they had enough time. Just kidding. But let me finish the story. It's, it doesn't have much to do with the end of the service, but everybody wants to know the end of the story, if you haven't read it recently. So the four lepers make their way back to the city. They call up the wall to the watchman on the wall. They deliver the message to the watchman. The watchman relays it back in whatever system they had to the royal palace. They wake up the king. The king wakes up his advisors. They don't believe it because it's too good to be true. So he sends out scouts in chariots. And they follow the, the departing army all the way to the river with things strewn everywhere. They come back. They report to the king. And the king says, open the gates. And the next day, a sea of the finest flour sold for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Two seahs of barley for a shekel. They were lepers who had stumbled into God's grace as if by accident. They had stumbled unknowingly into God's amazing provision of more than enough. Where were you when you stumbled into God's grace? What would you be if you hadn't stumbled into his more than enough? We need to have a moment like the lepers. There are no heroes. There's only saved and redeemed and filled nobodies. So as the worship team sings, the song they're going to sing is Grace so marvelous, words go, your grace so marvelous, all sufficient and free, is more, more than enough to redeem and rescue me. Last week, Pastor Chris told us our Father is here to help, and he's helped. This week, when we worship, it's time for us to give back to the Lord more than just worship. We need to say to our Father, 
You've given us more than enough. What do you want us to do with the excess left over? So please remain seated as the worship team finishes the sermon for us. I'll come back. how to respond to the Lord, really. We say, Lord, what, what do I need to stop doing? What do I need to start doing? And the Lord cautioned me, try to not to create so many scenarios and let him speak to you. Because that what he speaks to you, you'll actually do it. Because we're beggars that stumble into God's grace. Because of the church we were born in, because somebody shared the gospel with us when we needed it. It wasn't you. It wasn't me. It was Jesus who came and rescued us. What are we going to do with the more than enough? He's going to tell us. Would you stand with me, please? I'd like to invite the prayer workers forward. We're going to have what I like to call a soft close this morning. It's really early. We're not in a hurry. There's plenty of time for everything that needs to be done and eaten later. But a soft close is where we make an invitation and then we feel free to linger or we feel free to go and we're free because once we leave, 
we're lepers on a mission. The first invitation is I wanna remind all of us that if you feel like you're in a situation this morning that you are locked up and held captive and you can't get out and you don't know what to do and your supply has been cut off, I wanna remind you that God can make a noise for you. He doesn't have to do anything like so spectacular except some sound effects. If you come and be prayed for, he will either give you the sufficient grace to endure and persevere, or he will make a noise to deliver you right now. It's up to him. So inviting you to come as we come to a close. I think I'll leave it there. God is speaking to you. Come, this is your moment. If you haven't stumbled into his grace yet, if you're ready to make that decision, yeah, come up, get right with God. You've stumbled into his grace this morning. You need to make a new commitment to Jesus. That's the second invitation. Now receive the blessing. The Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Let's linger in his presence this morning. Hallelujah. And oh, let this song of praise ever rise from my lips from this moment till we're face to face come on let it be heard oh even though Take a moment to thank him for his grace today. Oh, your redeeming work. Oh, how precious is your blood. Is your grace, your mercy.